but perhaps not in uh, the history, uh, uh, not perhaps not in the history department, because uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, collaborations with uh, students and 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 um, uh, professors from uh, Uganda, but mostly in uh, in the departments of uh, of agriculture and life sciences, which is the main focus of uh, of my university. Uh, but a university is, is not a university when it does not have a history department uh, and a philosophy department, I would say. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that that this is recognized here uh, and I'm able to, uh, to be a historian in sort of a life sciences um, setting. Uh, and before I, I start my presentation, I would like just to say a few words about uh, my background. Um, I, I may not be familiar to, uh, to most of you. Um, but I am recently, uh, I have been affiliated to uh, the history department um, uh, of Makerere University uh, because I'm going to embark on a new uh, research project, uh, which I hope I will have a little bit of time uh, uh, talking about at the very end. Um, and this is, this is going to be the first time since uh, COVID that I will be able to come to Uganda and, and actually do research and, and meet people there. So uh, when this materializes, uh, I, I'm very keen to also uh, more actively participate in, in events uh, actually at the department. So I would like to, to be present there. Uh, but I have, um, um, I have, let me, let me see if my screen is sharing properly. Uh, could you uh, confirm that, Christopher? Yeah, uh, we can see your screen uh, quite well, at least for me. Um, does, it look, does it look like a full screen PowerPoint mode or? Uh... Um, it does not look like a full screen PowerPoint, but okay. everything, um, at least from my point of view here and those with me, um, we can see, we can read the text, we can see the pictures. So everything is very uh, visible. Yeah, I think I'll make a small change uh, to make it even better. Um, let me see if I can still. Uh, yes. Now you you should have a full screen now. Is that correct, uh, Chair? Yes, we have a full screen now. Perfect. Okay. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I wanted to start by by saying that uh, I've been working on uh, Uganda's economic history for uh, for some time now. I uh, finished my PhD in 2017, and out of that came came several articles. Uh, and when I was a, a postdoc, I was still working mostly on um, uh, on, on Uganda's economic history. Uh, here at the bottom or the top left, you can see uh, an article about uh, migration from uh, Rwanda and Burundi in the colonial period. Uh, I also published a book on migration. Uh, it's an edited volume, has a much broader scope in which I have a, a comparative chapter uh, where I look at migration patterns in, in Uganda and uh, in West Africa. Um, I have an article uh, about unequal opportunities in, in colonial Uganda. Uh, I have an article on, uh, on, on, on rural, rural welfare. Uh, one on, on cotton imperialism, actually, which is the, the topic of today. Uh, this is the article on which I, I will expand during my, um, uh, my talk today. And I have a, a piece on uh, income inequality in Uganda. So this is kind of my research background. Actually, most of my, my, my research, my output has been specifically on, uh, on Uganda. Uh, but today I'm going to give a presentation uh, which has a, a much, more, a much broader scope. It's, it's a comparative uh, a piece of research. Uh, it's not as much based in uh, primary sources, uh, but it's based in, in, let's say, comparative thinking. Uh, and, and you will see by, what I mean by that uh, as I go through my, um, uh, my talk. So um, the topic for today is um, uh, cotton imperialism uh, in Africa. The title here is uh, slightly different than on the, uh, uh, the advertisements. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but the main topic is, uh, is, is cotton imperialism um, uh, in Africa. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is um, uh, not so much uh, give sort of a revisionist take on this topic, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm intending to do here is to, let's say, interrogate uh, a well-received thesis on uh, cotton and colonialism in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and that thesis has, has many implications for the way we think about uh, colonial rule, uh, its legacies, uh, agency, choices of, uh, of African uh, producers in, uh, in this time period. 
Uh, and I've outlined my presentation as, as follows. I, I will start giving you um, uh, some sense of the broader literature and, and what I'm aiming to contribute. And then I'm going to try to tackle three questions. And I must confess, it's quite um, uh, an ambitious agenda for, uh, for the coming hour. Uh, but I, I hope I can co convey as much uh, to you as, uh, as possible. Uh, and the three questions are, well, the th three topics are, first of all, I'm, I'm going to try to find out if there was something that we could call cotton imperialism that was pursued uh, uh, in Africa uh, by European colonizers. Uh, then a second question is, uh, if this was uh, an agenda that existed, uh, a colonial agenda ag uh, that existed, to what extent did it materialize? Uh, did it work out the way that uh, colonizers had intended it? Uh, and my third topic kind of uh, expands on, on that second one uh, and, and requires an intermediate conclusion. And that intermediate conclusion is that uh, um, the question two cannot be answered with a straight yes or no, but that there was a lot of variation in, in outcomes uh, in terms of uh, cotton growing uh, projects and activities across uh, the African continent in, in the colonial period. Uh, and I think uh, rather than just come up with sort of a, a, a synthetic view of, of this, um, uh, this issue, this topic, we need to try to understand these uh, divergent outcomes. We need to try to explain um, why a certain uh, colonial policy, policy agenda worked out completely differently in one location uh, compared to another. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to give, let's say, a first shot at, uh, at this uh, by looking at uh, the role of uh, force, of, of coercion, the role of local markets. And then I will specific, specifically be looking at um, uh, local markets for, uh, for manufactured textiles. Um, and finally, I will... Uh, kind of try to fold in one of the papers that I just uh, showed to you, uh, which is about the role of uh, seasonality. Uh, and there are very large differences, uh, of course, uh, across Africa in terms of how rainfall is distributed within a year. And I'm going to try to, to make the point that uh, this rainfall seasonality is an, an important determinant of, uh, of, of cotton outcomes uh, in this period. And I will do so by focusing specifically on, on two cases. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I will look at Uganda, and I will compare Uganda with um, French West Africa. And then especially I will focus on uh, uh, what today are uh, Mali and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and hopefully I'll have time to, uh, to wrap things up in a conclusion. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start with sort of the, the introductory uh, remarks here. Um, so the way that many historians uh, have uh, perceived this, this history of cotton is um, uh, as, as sort of the, the, the most clear example of what one could call um, economic colonialism. Uh, there, there are, of course, uh, debates about the drivers of, uh, of, of, of the scramble, the European scramble for African territories uh, and the reasons why colonizers would maintain uh, colonies. Uh, there are cultural explanations, political explanations, but I think that most people would sort of abide by an economic explanation. Uh, which I summarize here as, as colonies were acquired and maintained to the benefit of uh, metropolitan European economies. Um, and there, there are several ways in which, of course, uh, well, African dependencies uh, would benefit uh, metropolitan economies. Uh, and I highlight two here, which are the most relevant to my case, and I think also the, the most widely uh, known ones. Uh, and the first one would be that um, uh, European nations were searching for markets for their for their uh, for their industrial products, um, and they were all producing massive amounts of uh, cheap, uh, fairly low quality textiles uh, and other goods, but mostly textiles. Uh, and they were looking for consumers uh, who would be able to buy these uh, these goods and. Uh, the way in which European countries uh, competed with one another for markets uh, was a driver of, of actually uh, colonial uh, intervention. Um, and the, the argument would be would here be that uh, the, the income um, uh, that's um, and so so the, the, the consumers of course needed to have some form of income to buy these uh, products and and the thinking the argument was well, uh, the, the income generated from um, exported cash crops uh, like cotton would stimulate consumption of European manufacturers and especially cotton textile. Now, another form of another leg, one could say, of economic colonialism is, is, is of course, the one of resource extraction, uh, where uh, African colonies were viewed by colonizers as, as a vital 
and a secure source of uh, raw material supplies for uh, metropolitan industries. Uh, and this was especially viewed as important in times of crisis, in times of uh, uh, warfare. And uh, cotton was considered the, the sort of the, 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 crucial, the crucial raw material here, or at least one of the crucial raw materials. Uh, why? Because um, the textile industries were, were kind of the driving force of the, the Industrial Revolution in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, the issue here was that uh, Europe actually cannot produce cotton. Uh, it is ecologically not suitable for uh, producing this, this raw material. So when your industries rely so heavily on a specific uh, crop and you cannot obtain that crop from your, own, uh, from your own land, you have to go look for it somewhere else. And uh, the situation before uh, uh, the scramble for Africa was a very strong reliance on the United States. Uh, and of course, we all know that uh, cotton in the United States used to be grown uh, by, uh, by enslaved people on plantations. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the American Civil War uh, posed a major disruption of this supply chain. And it also generated anxieties uh, among Europeans. Uh, will uh, uh, the United States continue to supply us with, with all of this raw material? Uh, especially because the United States itself was also industrializing on a rapid scale. So these are the sort of the economic arguments uh, here to view uh, cotton imperialism as, uh, as a form of economic colonialism. Uh, there was also a moral justification uh, 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 that was kind of imposed upon, uh, upon this uh, cotton imperialism. Uh, and that uh, should be seen in the context of the, the transition from uh, slavery to, uh, to what at the time was called legitimate commerce. Uh, the idea that uh, Africa should no longer export slaves, that this was an illegitimate, illegitimate uh, form of trade and it had to be replaced by something else. Uh, Africa should be uh, useful to the world, Africa should be developed. Uh, and the idea was then to replace slavery with uh, uh, what was called legitimate commerce, uh, which simply, be, uh, simply entailed uh, uh, the, the, the two points above that uh, African producers would, uh, would export raw materials uh, to the world market and would then uh, consume manufactured products from, uh, from, from Europe. Um, and uh, it needs to be remembered that, that this was at the time of the, the scramble for Africa, of course, uh, an important moral justification. Uh, despite, of course, uh, it is obvious uh, hypocrisy, uh, in, in, uh, especially in, in, in places like uh, the Belgian Congo. But that's a history that's, I think, quite familiar to, uh, to everyone in the room. Uh, we should also remember that, uh, had a, this, so this is sort of a, a story about a relationship between a colonizer and colony and, and the benefits that uh, the, co the colonizer could draw from having colonies. But there's also a local rationale. Uh, and that rationale is that once you acquire these uh, these territories, uh, you need to, of course, uh, pay for their uh, for their upkeep. Uh, British, French, uh, Portuguese taxpayers in Europe were not at all happy to see, to see their tax money uh, be spent on uh, administering uh, far away tropical dependencies uh, with, with which they had very little uh, relationship and, and from which the ordinary man might not have benefited so strongly. Um, and so, and, and these colonial revenues, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they had to be drawn from somewhere, uh, and that somewhere typically was trade. Uh, and, and the most common way to do this was to, uh, to tax imports, and so to tax the, the textiles that were coming from Europe uh, to Africa, uh, and of course also to directly tax agricultural production through uh, what in Uganda, for example, was a, a poll tax, right, and people could only pay their poll tax if they had something to pay for uh, to, to, to pay with and and this could be livestock it could be income from some sort of uh, wage labor but the far majority of Ugandans at this time uh, were producing cotton and later coffee to uh, to pay their uh, their poll tax um yeah so i have already mentioned that that cotton was kind of special and that that is because of the industrial revolution and its its crucial importance there uh, and this is something that scholars uh, uh, working on the topic have, 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 have repeatedly uh, remarked. Uh, so in, in a, a, a very nice um, uh, edited volume from 1995, Alan Isaacman and Richard Roberts uh, write that the cotton textile industry was a central consumer production sector in all European nations that scrambled to control African territories in the late 19th century. And Beckert in a fairly recent book uh, called Empire of Cotton, uh, writes that cotton and colonial expansion went uh, hand in hand. Now, I am far from the first person to, to study this topic. Uh, I need to make that very clear. 
uh, and I can rely on, on a, a very, very good body of uh, scholarship, uh, articles, monographs, uh, and, and this is fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, and what I find especially fascinating about it is usually when you write history, you look at things that happened uh, and even things that succeeded. Right, so if you, you write about uh, the spread of Christianity, you're going to look at societies where Christianity spreads fast. Uh, but if you really want to understand processes, you, of course, you also need to look at, process of, at, at, at examples of failure. Um, and the history of cotton and the writing about this history of cotton is actually full of uh, uh, work that actually discusses failure. So you have PhD students who look at the failure of cotton, uh, uh, cotton colonialism in a specific context. Uh, and to use the, the language of so, uh, social science, uh, there, there's no sample selection bias in this literature. We're not sampling on the cases of success, but we're also seeing a lot of work on the cases of failure, which, which makes it very interesting for uh, comparative research. But I would say that though the literature is, is rich, uh, it is heavily case study oriented. So uh, you have books about uh, Nigeria, about Chad, about Uganda, about uh, Congo, um, about uh, Zimbabwe, uh, about Mali, about Cote d'Ivoire. But you have very little work that actually puts these different cases in conversation uh, with one another. And those works that actually do try to provide to sort of come up with a broader uh, view, like the Isaacman and Roberts volume and the Beckett book that I mentioned before, uh, they typically show uh, what I would call a surprising uh, lack of appreciation for variation, both in terms of the local conditions in which these cotton projects unfolded and their outcomes. Uh, what also strikes me, and this is me uh, as, a, as an economic historian who uh, works with numbers and uses those to make historical arguments, I find that this literature tends towards the anecdotal and it barely considers uh, quantities and uh, magnitudes. Now, what are the conclusions that one finds in this literature? Um, first one, um, that colonizers and capitalists in Europe rally behind a coherent strategy of cotton imperialism. Second, that overall cotton imperialism proved to be what I call a wild goose chase, a failure, a premeditated failure. Third, that, the, uh, that cotton imperialism was resisted, uh, uniformly resisted by uh, uh, Africans on which it was imposed. Fourth, whenever cotton was adopted by, uh, by African growers, that this was a consequence of coercion. Um, fifth, that cotton imperialism was actually thwarted by the resilience of domestic textile economies. Yeah, so uh, in some cases there was resistance, in some cases there was coercion, but there was also the resilience of domestic textile economies, which meant that uh, farmers would actually sell their, sell their cotton to local buyers and not uh, to export companies. And the final point is, uh, and this is especially in Beckert's book, and he actually makes this point very explicitly, that cotton imperialism uh, impoverished Africa, that it was a major factor that explains underdevelopment uh, in the long run and, and the post-colonial uh, legacy. Now, my contribution here is to unpack cotton imperialism. So I'm, I'm trying to, to, to dig a layer deeper. I'm, I want to look at the aims. I want to look at the actors. Uh, and I want to look at differences between different European colonizers, uh, as well as shifts over time. Um, I'm trying to put some numbers on, on this history. So I'm trying to measure and compare output volumes, trade flows by colony and colonizer. And finally, what I tried to do is to use a structured comparison to analyze the role, uh, especially of seasonality on the propensity of African farmers to uh, adopt cotton. Um, and as a result, reevaluate the role of colonial coercion and the resilience of local manufacturing sectors in uh, cotton production outcomes. Now, let me get to part one of my, uh, of my talk. Um, so, and this is basically uh, what the question here is, is did something, did, did, some, did, did this coherent strategy of cotton imperialism, can we find it in the sources? Can we find it? Can we find evidence for it? Um, and I think some context here is, is, is important. So what we see in the 19th century is that uh, Britain is actually the first European nation that tries to kind of shed its dependence on the United States cotton uh, uh, imports. And it tries to do so in, in India, uh, uh, Britain's crown colony and, and historically speaking, the, the workshop of the world, the major uh, textile producer in the world before Britain uh, took over. Uh, but the British were actually not very successful uh, in, uh, in India in this respect. So both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality, 
uh, the amount of cotton that they were able to extract from India uh, was, was disappointing. Uh, and it did not uh, stop uh, this heavy reliance on uh, imports from the United States. And that's when we see Britain sort of reorienting its focus towards Africa. Second, what we see is that from the moment, especially from the moment that slavery is abolished, but even before this, uh, we see many unsuccessful attempts by companies, uh, by states, um, to establish cotton plantations in, in, in the sort of the British, British, French and Portuguese coastal enclaves. Uh, and these initiatives were, were pushed by European migrant, uh, merchants, by textile manufacturers, and also interestingly by uh, abolitionists uh, who were trying to find, they were arguing that, that Africa needed a new source of, uh, of income uh, after the ab abolition of slavery. And uh, we see many people who had very high hopes uh, in this period for uh, the, the future of cotton cultivation in Africa. For example, in 19, uh, 1860, uh, a British commentator uh, described Africa as the British cotton industry's promised land. Um, and as I said, this, uh, this idea resonated with, with abolitionist ideology as well. Uh, cotton should be grown by Africans in Africa. And this was actually at the time called native agency. So agency is a word, a word that many scholars uh, like to use. And it's fascinating to go back to these sources and find the word agency also used back then in, in the late 19th century, instead of uh, black slaves in, uh, in the Americas. Uh, and ultimately, in the 20th century, what you see uh, sort of coming out of this, uh, uh, this, this ideological argument is that cotton becomes to be described as, uh, as a black man's uh, crop, which is a very curious uh, thing to say, uh, I would say. Um, so uh, during the American Civil War, uh, cotton supplies in Europe were uh, heavily disrupted. Uh, concerns about supplies were, 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 were up. Uh, and there we see um, a very strong uh, resurgence of interest. For example, uh, another British commentator, 1871, the first year of the American Civil War, uh, sorry, this is after the American Civil War, uh, a few years after it, uh, writes that cotton will yet come in abundance from Africa. There are immense districts that could supply all that Lancashire uh, requires. But what we also see is that right after the American Civil War, uh, cotton prices began to, to decline and interest uh, waned. And you, you can see that here nicely in this graph uh, in which I have plotted the price of, uh, of cotton here, that's the orange line. And I've also plotted in a few uh, price developments of other major export commodities from, uh, from Africa, groundnuts, palm oil, and cocoa. And uh, you can see that, that sort of the, the cotton price development is, is a bit different from the other ones. The other ones, they, they move more or less in, in, in sync, as you can see here. Uh, but with cotton, you can see that these prices go up very sharply during the American Civil War, and then they began to uh, decline. Uh, and it's important to, uh, to, to just state here that if you want to make an argument that cotton was kind of an important driver for the scramble of Africa, that Europeans wanted uh, to, to control these territories because they wanted cotton, the price developments do not really resonate with this, uh, with this argument, because at the time of the Berlin Conference, uh, cotton prices had actually been declining. Uh, quite considerably from their, their peak during the, uh, the American Civil War, whereas the prices for these other, uh, these, these other crops uh, were actually a lot, uh, a lot higher, relatively speaking, in this, uh, in this period. And so it's, it's, it's this sort of a first conclusion here is that we have people who try to argue or insinuate that cotton was kind of a, a major driver for the scramble in Africa. It's not very plausible. So now we're talking from the production side, we can also talk a little bit from the consumption uh, side. So uh, foreign textiles have been in large demand, uh, especially uh, across West Africa, but also uh, in East Africa since at least the 18th century and, 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 and even before. Uh, and, and Manchester merchants, yeah, so this is the, the Lancashire cotton uh, uh, textile sector in Britain, they were deeply entrenched in, in parts of coastal West Africa before the scramble. Uh, and they were kind of pushing their governments to, to increase their involvement um, uh, in Africa. Uh, and even uh, Henry Morton Stanley, um, uh, King Leopold's adjutant, uh, was also making this case. Uh, he said, if, if every female inhabitant of the vast Congo Basin brought, uh, bought only one Sunday dress made of Lancashire cloth and exports uh, of 300 million yards, which is a really large number, uh, would result. And so here we see a, a little bit of a root actually of, of this philosophy of uh, cotton imperialism. 
And then another price hike actually occurred uh, from the late uh, 1890s onwards. Uh, and this was caused by, by the speculation in, in commodity markets. And it was also called by a pest in the United States, the so-called boll weevil, which suppressed yields in the United States. And because the United States was still the dominant supplier, prices uh, uh, went up considerably. And this, in this context, we see a renewed call for African cotton exports. Uh, and this time, uh, it happens in a colonial context. By this time, uh, almost all of, uh, of Africa has been carved up uh, by European colonizers who have taken uh, territorial control over uh, the continent. And here we see uh, these, this, this type of thinking about the importance of Africa as a source of cotton, we see it resurging. Uh, so uh, one British cotton expert um, uh, writes that Lancashire's future salvation lies mainly in West Africa. Uh, the British Cotton Growing Association uh, describes Kano in northern Nigeria as the mecca of the Lancashire uh, spinning trade. And most of my examples, by the way, come from, uh, from a British context. But uh, for now, I think uh, I, would, I would say that this type of sentiment also existed in France and it existed in Portugal and it existed in uh, Germany uh, as well. And what we, see, what we see happening here is that, uh, well, around 1900, and especially so uh, between 1902 and 1906, we see that this, this idea, this sort of attempt to, uh, to, to increase cotton exports from Africa is um, uh, materialized in the establishment of uh, cotton growing associations. These are technically uh, lobbying groups in, uh, in Europe, which try to push their governments to, uh, to work towards increasing cotton exports from Africa. And here you can see actually this effect of the boll weevil on the price of, uh, of cotton. Eh? So uh, this is when the boll weevil first arrives in the United States. It, it first spreads slowly and then begins to spread fast. And then we can see the price of cotton going up. And it's quite clear that in the context of these rising prices, we see that this call for cotton imperialism becomes louder. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so this, this philosophy or this policy of cotton imperialism, I think, is, is, is best captured by, uh, by Lugard, uh, who actually only later became governor general of uh, Nigeria. Uh, at the time, I think he was high commissioner of, of northern Nigeria, but he wrote in 1904, um, uh, that a better class of English cloth than that now imported is required. Uh, so he's first of all saying, well, currently uh, African consumers are not so interested in our product because the quality is too bad, but we should get this good quality cotton. And then he believes that this will super, supersede what uh, the, the native, uh, so the locally produced uh, textile, and so bring the raw cotton on the market. The industry, uh, industries of spinning thread, weaving and dyeing uh, afford occupation to many thousands who may possibly become additional producers of raw cotton, right? So through the import of British textiles, uh, Africans who specialize in the production of the raw material, which they then would export to Britain. Now let's try to sort of conclude a little bit about this first uh, issue. Huh? So do we see uh, the existence of, uh, uh, of, of, of this policy program, a coherent policy program of cotton imperialism in Africa? Now I would say that indeed at the time, Cotton imperialism was formulated as an imperial economic uh, doctrine, which involved the export of the raw material and the import of the manufactured material. And those two things were connected to one another. Now, how coherent was this uh, policy? Uh, was it really sort of a very important part of the way that, was, uh, that Europeans thought about colonialism? Did, did cotton play a crucial role there? I would say that interest waxed and waned depending on uh, price developments and uh, therewith the fortunes of uh, European textile industries. Um, did this, so, so the question now is, so, uh, so if we have established that there is something uh, in, 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 in colonialism, if there is this sort of policy or this philosophy of cotton imperialism, do we see that this rhetorical commitment translates actually into uh, committed efforts. Eh? So we've seen the establishment of these lobby groups. Do colonial states actually uh, take on uh, this, this agenda of, uh, of cotton imperialism? And if so, how successful were they in their uh, pursuit? In other words, did cotton imperialism materialize in Africa? Now, most uh, uh, recent scholars would say uh, absolutely not. 
Uh, and there's especially one chapter in the Isaacman and, um, uh, and Roberts vol volume, which uh, argues this point very forcefully. Uh, and this is a guy called Porter who says, never was so much misplaced effort devoted to an enterprise as the production of cotton in sub-Saharan colonial Africa. This photosynthetic difference, uh, and thereby he means the fact that uh, the, the, the tropics have uh, a relatively low level of photosynthesis, and cotton actually needs quite a, a large amount of photosynthesis. So the, the, the more like uh, uh, the producers uh, on, on higher latitudes would, would be more successful than those in Africa. Uh, as well uh, as cotton's wide production in large, better suited areas, doomed from the start the metropolitan dream of developing a competitive cotton industry in tropical Africa. So now I'm going to do what I do, and that is I'm going, I'm going to look at the numbers, right? So this is a statement. Uh, is this actually what, uh, what we see in the numbers? Now here uh, in, in, in this graph, uh, what you can see is um, uh, with the, the, the blue line, you can see the total uh, production of, or the total export of cotton from Africa from the whole continent here uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, thousand bills, right? So for example, in 1941, uh, 1.2 million uh, bills of cotton were exported from Africa. Now you can clearly see that the line goes up, right? So there's definitely some uptake of, uh, of cotton uh, in Africa. And I should mention, and that's important that Basically, no cotton was grown by, uh, by on European plantations. Yeah, so I already mentioned that there was this widespread belief that cotton was a black crop. Uh, so European uh, plantation owners, uh, they were marginally involved in the production of uh, cotton. There were some attempts, for example, in, in early uh, colonial German East Africa, which were, by the way, heavily resisted uh, locally. Uh, but almost all of this cotton was grown by, uh, by African smallholders uh, and sometimes in, in, in forced labor uh, projects. And here, the orange line shows the percentage of uh, African exports in total world production of uh, cotton. And this total world production excludes communist countries. Uh, and what you can see here is that uh, Africa's share also increased. And it increased from, well, practically 0% to about 5% of uh, world production. Now, when you look at these numbers, you can say, well, the line goes up. So yes, uh, actually the, this wasn't failure, this was success. But of course, if you want to measure uh, whether some policy agenda is successful, you also have to think about, first of all, the investment that you make. Uh, does it justify the, the, the investments? And, and secondly, you have to think about um, uh, the initial expectations, right? So, and if the initial expectations were very high, uh, and we only see a modest increase, and from, uh, uh, from a European perspective, this was not a success. Uh, and here on the right, you can see that, that cotton was, was not the most important export from Africa. Uh, coffee, copper, cocoa, and peanuts were, were more important uh, in, in 1957, uh, towards the end of, of the, the colonial era. And so in the, with this graph, we can still go in both directions. Now, if we look at uh, uh, where, where was this, uh, this, this cotton from Africa, where was it actually grown, then we can see that there is a very big variation uh, between colonies, and there was a very big variation between colonizers. So here on the left, uh, I'm showing you a, a graph with uh, the total uh, cotton output uh, in, in thousands of metric tons uh, from uh, the well, about 20 most important cotton exporters from Africa. And what you can clearly see here, especially for the, the interwar period, is that uh, uh, output was heavily concentrated in a small number of cases. And so in the Sudan, uh, we see that there was a lot of uh, cotton production. This was mainly irrigated cotton production, a little bit similar to what was going on in Egypt. And the second most important uh, uh, exporter, and actually in the 1930s, the most important uh, exporter of cotton in Africa was Uganda, uh, followed by, uh, by the Belgian uh, Congo. And then we see that towards the end of the colonial era, it becomes uh, spread out a little bit more. And we see that Mozambique, Nigeria, uh, Tanzania, Chad, uh, and, and the Central African Republic and Togo also begin uh, to export sizable amounts of cotton. Now on the right, you can see that uh, uh, cotton output from Africa was heavily dominated by, uh, by British territories. So in the, in the 30s, about uh, three quarters of all cotton came from 
uh, British territories. And in the, the 1950s, this was still about 60%, uh, percent, right? So the, the, this is where, um, uh, where this, this rise in output was heavily concentrated in, uh, in, in, in these countries. And, and those, most of those were British uh, territories. Now, one thing that I did uh, to, to try to see if, if we can link actually these, uh, these cotton outcomes uh, to this idea, this philosophy of uh, cotton imperialism was to see where does the cotton uh, go? Where does it go? Is it in fact true that all the cotton that was grown in British territories went to the British textile industry in Europe? Was all the cotton that was grown in the French uh, African colonies sent to the French textile industry? Same for the Belgian, same for the Portuguese. And another question is how important did these African raw cotton imports become for these industries, right? Uh, did African colonies become a major uh, source of uh, the raw material or not really? Now that question here is, is answered on, on the left. So what we see in, in this table on the left is the share of uh, British, uh, French, Belgian and Portuguese raw cotton imports coming from British East Africa, Nigeria, French West Africa, Congo and Portuguese Africa. And let me just give you, uh, you don't have to, to sort of absorb all these numbers, but let me take uh, uh, two examples to illustrate the point. So um, uh, only about 1% of all of the cotton imports into um, Britain came from Nigeria. And if we relate this to the statement that uh, Kano would be the Mecca of Lancashire, that clearly did not materialize, right? Because if only 1% of all of the imports are actually from Nigeria, then this is not the Mecca, the future salvation of Lancashire. So in that sense, we can clearly say uh, there's a, uh, the, 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 this policy of cotton imperialism was not successful. The only case where this doesn't really apply is uh, the Portuguese territories, and especially in the late colonial period. And there we see that almost all of the cotton that was imported into Portugal uh, and used by the Portuguese textile industry, which I should note was a lot smaller than the British textile industry, but almost all of that cotton actually came from Angola and Mozambique. So there we can say, well, here we really see that Africa became a crucial source of, uh, of the raw material. On the right here, uh, we see the amount, the share of the, of the cotton that was produced in these territories that actually went to the colonizer, right? So if we look here, for example, uh, to the cotton that was grown in French West Africa, uh, that, so between 73.9 and at some point even 100% of that cotton actually went to France, which means that some of it actually did not go to France, it went to other European uh, nations, some of it might have gone to the United States or uh, to Japan. Uh, but we can see here that certainly uh, there was uh, this, this idea that, that, uh, that, that uh, if you control a territory in Africa, you can produce a commodity there and you can send it to your own country to benefit from it, that seems to have actually been practiced. Aside from one very important exception, and that is British East Africa. So if we look at British East Africa uh, in, in, in 1955, only 16% of the cotton that was grown in British East Africa actually went to Britain, right? So, so this is quite curious uh, and it doesn't fit with this idea of cotton imperialism because if it was cotton imperialism, then you would actually take all that stuff and you would bring it to Europe. And that is not what happened. Uh, it was less than a, than a fifth of all the cotton that was produced in, uh, 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 in, in especially Uganda, eh, because Kenya and Tanzania were not as involved in uh, cotton production, went to, uh, uh, went to Britain. Um, and, and if you remember well, that actually Uganda was the major cotton exporter from Africa. It kind of puts a little bit in perspective this, uh, this idea that, uh, uh, that this link between the colonizer and the colony was crucial in terms of uh, cotton. Now, the other side of the, the cotton imperialism story is that of uh, textile output. Um, and so how much of the textiles that were produced in, in Europe actually went to Africa? And there the picture is a little bit uh, similar. So we see that, uh, well, Nigeria um, absorbed about 
four, five, six, seven percent of all the textiles that were produced in uh, in Britain. That's sizable. It's an important market, but it's not the key market. French West Africa, well, quite sizable as well, 10, 15 percent, but not the crucial market. And again, only in Portuguese Africa do we see uh, that African markets were crucial for the Portuguese textile industry. And that is, in some years, almost all of the textile that was produced in Portugal actually went to Angola and uh, Mozambique. If we look at this from the African side, uh, and we look at Nigeria, for example, and we ask what share of the textiles in Nigeria actually came from Britain. There we see that in the beginning it was very high, but later it became lower. Uh, so this means that uh, the Nigerian market was also open to uh, French, Japanese, Indian uh, um, uh, importers. So it's not like uh, uh, the European colonizers completely restricted their African markets to uh, their own industries. Yeah, they, they, they opened them up actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this sort of applies so most cases here, uh, the, the French were a little bit more likely to, uh, uh, to, to import their manufacturers to Africa, uh, and so were, again, uh, the Portuguese. Now, um, another way of, of, of asking the question is, if we see cotton adoption, uh, like happened in Uganda, does that mean that cotton imperialism succeeded in Uganda? Now, and this, this whole point that most cotton in Uganda actually did not go to Britain already puts that into question, all right? Um, uh, but we can also, uh, we can also uh, look at it a little bit differently. Uh, and, and there we can, uh, I found a very interesting actually prediction by, uh, by, by, by a British cotton ex uh, expert in 1915, uh, who wrote that the Uh, who is about, and he compared this to Uganda and he said, well, uh, it's doubtful whether any large quantity of cotton, say 100,000 bales per annum is likely to be raised. And what happened in reality was exactly the other way around. So uh, Nigeria in, in the 40 year period between 1920 and 1960 exported only 70,000 bales annually, which is a mere 1.2% of what was expected. And by the way, Nigeria did become an important ground exporter. Whereas Uganda exported 260,000 bills, which is, um, well, almost fourfold the exports from Nigeria and 260% uh, of what was projected by, uh, by Todd, right? So here we can say, if, if Europeans had this agenda and if they executed it, and if their focus was on Nigeria, they were clearly not very successful. Uh, and if they, they were very, where they were not so sure if, if there was going to be any success in Uganda and Uganda became successful. This was unexpected. This was not planned in any way. Now, when it comes to uh, the fact that uh, uh, only a small percentage of cotton from Uganda actually went to Britain, it's interesting to look at this, uh, this quote from, uh, from one stakeholder in this industry. Uh, and this is a, a British cotton ginner in uh, Uganda. And he's actually complaining about it. He says, it is a curious commentary upon British colonial rule that an industry that has been built up with British capital, aided at the beginning by grants and aid from the British taxpayer and later by voluntary contributions from the Lancashire cotton industry should be jeopardized for the sole benefit of the natives of a dependency that is through boycott and legislation endeavoring to shut out the manufacturers of Lancashire while some two thirds of that crop is now diverted to the Bombay market, right? So even from the perspective of those people who would have loved to see uh, this, uh, uh, this, this policy of cotton imperialism put into practice, uh, it, they, they, they did not see it. And they did not see it uh, in their uh, day and age. Uh, so that, that leaves us kind of with a question. Uh, so, so if it wasn't this philosophy of cotton imperialism, what, what explains these persistent attempts by Europeans to, um, uh, to, to cultivate cotton, to grow cotton in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Africa? Uh, and it's important to, to actually acknowledge that at this time, the textile industries in Europe, they, they were waning. They were on their way down. They were, their importance was, uh, was declining. Um, so we're not talking here about uh, colonizers who extract major resources which fuels their industrialization. 
uh, actually private enthusiasm, the ent enthusiasm of business people to invest in cotton imperialism had actually declined very sharply by the time that it was actually being put into practice and cotton exports began to increase. Now, what did happen is uh, that these uh, colonial import markets, textile import markets and export markets, raw, export, raw cotton export markets, uh, were, were seen as an instrument to actually uh, curb industrial unemployment in Europe, right? So cotton from Africa was not seen as a, as a source of industrialization, but it was seen as a, as a, a way to basically stop these, what are called sunset industries, suns industries that are on the decline, to stop them from declining even faster and to maintain European employment actually and, and using uh, colonial territories for that purpose, right? Now, is this still cotton imperialism? Uh, we can perhaps uh, have a nice discussion about that in, uh, uh, after my presentation and I look forward to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'm not ready, uh, by the way, this is just sort of an intermediate intervention uh, or um, um, uh, invitation for you to, to think about this question. Now, another thing that cotton could do for, uh, for colonizers was that it could prop up colonial budgets. And those colonial budgets were, of course, under pressure during the, 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 the two world wars and uh, during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And I noted already that cotton could be taxed. Yeah? And, and these cotton projects were kind of repurposed to prop up uh, the, the budgets of uh, uh, colonial states. And in some cases, we even see a very strong uh, intensification of effort. So the French from the 1940s onwards really continue to try and try and try uh, to get cotton exported from, uh, from their territories. And, and, and curiously enough, interestingly enough, uh, this only succeeds after independence. So we see in the former French territories in West Africa after independence that cotton exports begin to expand very rapidly. Again, can we still call this uh, cotton imperialism? Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. I'm also uh, going to skip this slide, which kind of summarizes my points. And I'm just going to hope that they have stuck in, in your mind because I want to, uh, to also spend a little bit of time. And I think I have about 10 minutes left, uh, uh, Christopher, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and maybe, maybe you can grant me just five minutes more to, so that I can finish my, my story. Um, uh, to talk about these, these divergent outcomes that, that we've seen clearly uh, in, uh, in, 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 let's say, this graph, right? These are very divergent outcomes, very different outcomes between, uh, between colonies and unpredicted outcomes, outcomes that were not anticipated by, uh, by European colonizers. So what, what explains this? And I, I want to just highlight three uh, possible explanations, three factors that I, I think played a role and I'm going to say that I think that there's one factor that has actually been a little bit underestimated in the literature, uh, but that I think was, was quite an important one. And that is seasonality, but I will get to that in a moment. First, I want to say a few words about uh, coercion, uh, which is typically mentioned as the main driving force. So the idea is uh, if, you, if you're a European colonizer and you want uh, people in your colonies to export this crop, you need to force them. And the more force you use, the more, the higher the, the output will be. Uh, now, one way that, I mean, force is very difficult uh, to measure. It's very complicated uh, to do this as, a, as an economic historian. Uh, th th there are some interesting uh, papers actually that, that, that measure coercion, uh, but I, I could not really think of a way uh, to do this. But what one thing that coercion does is it suppresses prices, right? So you, you should imagine that you are uh, you're a producer and you can produce a certain, uh, a certain good. And then of course, if you do that, you want to have a price for it. Okay? You, you expect a certain price for your effort. Uh, now, if you were that same guy or lady and uh, someone comes and forces you to do it, then they uh, uh, then they can uh, they can force you to actually accept a lower price for it. So they complement a lower price with force. They use force to force you to accept a lower price. They cannot say uh, well. They can try, but it's very hard to say. Look, you have to grow cotton for me, and you're not going to get anything for it. Because if you do that, then people are very likely to to resist, 
people are very likely to be evasive. People are very likely to just not collaborate. And that is very costly because then you have to put people in prison. You have to do all sorts of things that are expensive. So if you, if you think yeah, from the mind of, uh, of a colonizer, uh, you can use coercion to reduce uh, the price. And if we uh, look at prices, we actually um, uh, see a picture that, that is quite consistent with this idea. So here, if we look at uh, Uganda, and I I've, I've so-called, this is called indexing. So uh, the prices for cotton, the grower price, the prices received by farmers, I have given them a one. And then I've expressed the prices uh, given to uh, producers in French equatorial Africa, Congo and Mozambique uh, as, as a share of that price. And what you can see here is that for almost all years in these other three territories, the prices for cotton were considerably below those that were provided, that were given to, uh, to uh, Ugandan cotton growers, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Uganda's cotton growing system was not, was certainly not without uh, coercion, especially in the, in the early years. Um, but these three territories, uh, French Equatorial Africa, uh, Mozambique and, and, and Congo were especially known to have very repressive, very coercive uh, cotton uh, systems. So the, these were, were clearly the most um, uh, coercive cotton systems. Uh, and, and, and even though this is not direct proof, the prices that we see here are indeed consistent uh, with that. Um, and what is also interesting to note is that in these countries, we see almost immediately after the end of the colonial era, uh, especially in, in Congo and in Chad, we see that cotton collapses, right? And if you force people to do something and then you stop forcing them, then it's very likely that people stop doing something. Uh, whereas in Uganda, Uganda's cotton sector actually began uh, continue to expand and it only began to, uh, to decline sharply uh, in, in 1972, 1973, uh, and I think it, it's probably quite clear uh, to the audience here that this has a lot to do also with uh, the expulsion uh, of, of Indians who played a very uh, important role in the cotton sector as, as ginners, traders, uh, middlemen, etc. However, so if we look at coercion, it's not a sufficient condition. So uh, there, there are many cases where coercion was tried, but it wasn't successful. So even if we say, well, coercion played an important role and it did in certain cases, not so much in others, we have to ask why it succeeded. Uh, and so, so why was it more successful in some places than others? And then I would say that these three cases, Chad, uh, French Equatorial Africa, but especially Chad, Congo, uh, this should say, I'm sorry about that, high cotton suitability in Mozambique. Uh, they, they all had uh, specific factors that, uh, uh, that, that explain why coercion was successful. So in Chad, uh, cotton was grown in an area with, uh, with, with a lot of uh, water. Uh, area Cotton fields were, were, were flooded by the river. This uh, resulted in, in high soil fertility. Uh, people could fish. They had alternative sources of income. Uh, in Mozambique, uh, because it's in South Africa, uh, you have higher potential cotton yields, the photosynthetic potential is higher. And in the Congo, you have two rainy seasons. Uh, and, and I will get back to that in a moment, which is also helpful for, uh, uh, for being able to grow cotton without having to give up on your, uh, on your subsistence, on, on your food crops. The second factor would be um, that you can, you can, one other thing that people can do when you coerce them is they can flee, they can move, they can migrate, they can, can get out of, uh, of the coercive uh, system. And uh, large scale labor migration in, uh, in colonial Africa is, is partly a, a response where people are trying to, to, to flee away from uh, coercive systems. The flip side of that is that coercion works well in isolated places where it's difficult for people to, to move out and it's difficult for people to do something different, to have alternative sources of uh, income. And uh, Chad and, and especially Northern Mozambique and, and large parts of, uh, of the Congo were actually very remote uh, places. So there were very few exit options for people uh, to pursue, which made it easier for colonizers to force them, to coerce them. Um, now, coercion was also, uh, to, to get back, to, to link this up again with cotton imperialism, the motivation for colonizers to, uh, to coerce people differed. Uh, in the case of Chad, it was very clearly uh, the case that Chad was extremely poor, 
uh, and it was almost impossible to, to, to have a colony there because you could not pay for uh, the administrators, the, the police, the, the prison guards, etc. So uh, the French were looking for a source of income and they decided that it should be cotton. In the case of Mozambique, it was a more sort of clear cut uh, example of cotton imperialism. Uh, where, the, where the aim was to export the raw material to Portugal and import uh, textile manufacturers from Portugal into Mozambique. Uh, and finally, in the case of Congo, uh, well, we should see this in the context where the Belgians were really trying to, uh, to, 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 to utilize all of the labor potential that was available in the Congo. They wanted people to work, 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 work to generate value for uh, the colonizer. Okay, I have two, two more points uh, to make here. And the first one is about um, local, local textile markets. And, and I have to, 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 to recall, remind you that this was one of the, the explanations in the, in the cotton imperialism literature. Uh, so the idea is that the colonizers wanted the stuff, but the Africans didn't want to provide the stuff. And the reason for that is that they preferred to sell their cotton to local uh, buyers. Uh, and and he, this is especially relevant in, in West Africa. Uh, Uganda did not really have a textile sector. Uh, uh, before the colonial era. And, and I think we all know that, that Ugandans clothed themselves in a different way. Uh, hides, um, bark cloth, and of course people wore cotton cloth, but this was, uh, this was imported through the Indian Ocean. Um, so the question here is, is it true that do we see that in places where cotton imperialism failed, where uh, African cotton output disappointed was much lower than one would expect based on colonial attempts, um, colonial investments, colonial uh, ambitions, are those regions that had a strong pre-existing textile sector? And then we do find that this is indeed to some extent the case. So for example, in, in Cameroon, the French were not very successful. Uh, they tried to, to get people to grow cotton, uh, but Cameroonians didn't really take to it. The, 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 exports, the exports were very low. Uh, um, same, to, same in French West Africa. So in, um, uh, in especially in Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, um, the, uh, the, there was actually a lot of cotton growing happening locally and there were vibrant textile sectors and there were very few exports. Whereas in Chad and in the Central African Republic, which did not have very strongly developed local textile sector, we do see that these exports uh, uh, succeed, right? So the, the pattern seems to, to hold. And even if we compare uh, West Africa and East Africa, if we recall these very high expectations from Nigeria and these low expectations from Uganda, uh, one could again say, well, West Africa had very strong domestic textile sectors, East Africa much less so, and therefore, um, uh, yeah, it, is, it, is, it is possible that perhaps uh, West African cotton growers would sell their stuff to local buyers. East African uh, cotton growers had no choice but to sell their product to, uh, to the export market. And in that context, uh, one should also know, and this is a very curious thing for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for an economist or for an economic historian to understand, and that is that domestic buyers, they typically pay three to five times the amount given in the export market. So if you would have a, a, an export uh, trader come to your farm and say, I would like to buy your cotton, they would give you only a third or a fifth of the price that a, do a domestic buyer uh, would pay. And the curious thing is, here, why would a domestic payer pay so much more uh, for, um, uh, for the raw material uh, than uh, an export uh, buyer would do? Uh, I don't have really time now to go into this question, but if you find that interesting and if you want to discuss it a little bit more, I can, I can bring it up in the, in the discussion. Question though remains, uh, so this is, this is a correlation, uh, it's a pattern, but is it also a causal pattern? Now, uh, the, the, the colonial, the cotton um, imperialism literature would say so. Um, and so Beckett, for example, uh, explicitly states that European colonialists competed with African purchasers of raw cotton and the continued strength of the domestic industry. Now, I've looked into this a little bit more uh, in the case of uh, the French Sudan, it was today called uh, Mali, and there uh, a, a very renowned historian, uh, Richard Roberts, uh, has indeed argued uh, very explicitly that the failure of colonial cotton development in the French Sudan uh, he uses the word colonial, colonial cotton development, I would call this cotton imperialism, is directly attributable to the persistence of the pre-colonial handicraft textile industry. But I've researched this, I've looked into this a little bit more, and I've looked into the numbers, and I find this argument not very plausible. 
because uh, if you really start looking at how much cotton uh, uh, Malinese farmers were growing in the pre-colonial period, this was actually very limited. Um, so it's not that they were consuming or they were growing vast amounts of cotton, and I'm quoting Roberts here, but they were actually, they had integrated the production of raw cotton into their uh, cropping cycles. They were intercropping it. Uh, they had uh, multi-annual perennial varieties that they were growing that required less labor inputs. Uh, they were using specific hardy varieties uh, that could withstand the climate, that could withstand pests, but the amount was actually quite small. So I don't think that it's, it's plausible to say that farmers were growing a lot of cotton and that were diverting it into the, the, the local market, but they were simply not growing it in sufficient quantities to make a dent on the export markets. And this is unlike what was happening in Uganda, which clearly did produce very large quantities. Um, yeah, and if, there, there are all sorts of statistics uh, that, that actually support his view. Um, and then, of course, the question, eh? so if I'm saying it's not diversion, but it's just lower production, the final question, and I have to go through this a bit briefly, unfortunately, is why did farmers in the West African savanna not adopt cotton on a larger scale? Even though eh, they, they, they were forced, they were cajoled, they were pushed, uh, and, and colonizers uh, used a certain amount of, um, uh, of coercion that, that actually was successful in other cases, but not here. So why not? What's going on? And that is where actually uh, I, I, yeah, I, I come in with a paper that I've already published. And it, this is a little bit strange, but one, one, because one would say, well, you first start with the big story and then uh, there's still a little puzzle left and then you dig into that, that puzzle. But in my case, it was the other way around. I started with a smaller puzzle and then I began to ask bigger questions. So today I'm giving you the big questions. The smaller puzzle is in, uh, in the paper. Um, and, and I, I'm just going to, uh, to try to summarize the argument, which in, in essence is very uh, simple. And the argument, I think I can best illustrate that uh, using um, yeah, okay. let me take one step back. Uh, and I'm still mindful of the time, uh, Christopher, and, and apologizing that I, I need a little bit more than uh, was assigned to me. I beg for your uh, forgiveness in that respect. Um, but what I, uh, okay, so, so, so what I want to say is, so why did farmers in Cote d'Ivoire and in Mali, why did, not, why, why did they not adopt cotton uh, to a larger extent? And uh, one way of, so what I did in this paper that, that I published is I, I tried to make a, a very explicit comparison with, uh, with Uganda. Uh, and what you can see here, and I wanted to just show this to you because I think this is, these are beautiful uh, figures. Here you can see uh, the, the, the cotton exports from Uganda. And you can see that they, they rise very early in the, in the early 20th century and they stay fairly high and then they, uh, they collapse uh, in, in the Amin years. Uh, this is a very strong collapse that happens here, but it has a very clear explanation. It's, it's to do with, uh, with the Amin era and the economic policies of uh, the Amin government. Uh, whereas in the Sudan and the Mali, yeah, so the French also came in here uh, at the same time as they did in Uganda and they began to push for cotton, but they were very unsuccessful. Uh, and only after 1960, do we see a massive takeoff, right? And this is really quite sizable. And uh, on the right hand, you, you, can, you can just see it uh, corrected for, for population because population grows over time. And so you would expect more cotton output. Uh, so this is the same graph, but corrected for uh, population. Now, my argument in, in this paper is that if we, we want to understand why Uganda became such a large cotton exporter and why French West Africa uh, did not, we actually have to look, we have to go all the way down to the, uh, to the farm. Uh, and we have to go all the way down to agricultural practices and agricultural conditions. And to make it even simpler, we have to go back to, uh, to, 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 to a simple distribution of, of rainfall. Uh, and what we see then is then we see that in, in these territories in, uh, in, in, in West Africa, in these West African nations, rainfall is heavily concentrated in, in a few months of the year. So this is in Cote d'Ivoire, northern Cote d'Ivoire. If you go a little bit more to the north, uh, to, to Mali, for example, the, the distribution would be even more skewed. So rain would really be concentrated only in three or four months of the year. In Uganda, we see a much more smoothly distributed uh, distribution of, of rainfall and also with clear, uh, clear bimodal pattern with, with two, uh, two rainy peaks 
uh, per year. And uh, this applies to, uh, to Uganda, but it also applies to Eastern and Northern uh, Uganda. So this bimodal rainfall pattern is something that, that exists everywhere in, uh, in, in Uganda. And actually, interestingly enough, the, the total quantities of rainfall are not that different, right? So in both cases, it's about uh, 1400 uh, millimeters uh, per year. Yeah, so, but it's about the distribution. And what happens as a result of that distribution is that farmers in, in, in West Africa, they had to grow all of their food crops and all of their cotton at the same time. And if you have to do that, then it becomes very risky business to, uh, to, to, to grow a crop that you cannot eat, uh, for which you're probably going to receive a, a low price on, on the international markets. So you're just simply not going to do it. And if a colonizer wants to still do it and still get it from you, they have to push you very hard. They have to apply so much coercion that it's at some point no longer worth it. Whereas in Uganda, because of that sort of bimodal rainfall pattern, what happened was that farmers would grow their food crops in the first season. And then if the yields were good, and uh, if they had sufficient food to eat, they could allocate the remaining uh, labor resources to the cultivation of cotton in uh, the second year. So it would be much less risky and uh, uh, colonizers would have to apply a much lower level of coercion to achieve uh, the same results. Now I have, this is something that I've studied very, in very careful detail and, and very thoroughly. Uh, and, if, and also statistically, as you can, you can see here, but I will not bother you with that for now. If you're interested, this is something that's been published and that is available in, uh, in open access. So let me uh, conclude with this slide uh, and, and to sort of wrap it all up. So what we see is a large rift between what I call the rhetorical commitment to cotton imperialism and its actual uh, materialization. Uh, and when we look at its materialization, we have to ask, you know, was this still cotton imperialism? Was it still imperial extraction? Or had it, did it have a different rationale? Was it about financing the colonial state? Now, the opposition between a coercive colonial state committed to a cotton imperialism versus resistant and resilient Africans, I don't think it helps us to understand these diverse outcomes that I highlighted in my presentation. And so cotton output was only in some cases explained by coercion. And as I've tried to argue, there was no direct competition between local markets and import export traders. And if this competition existed, it was not the main reason why cotton imperialism failed in some places. Now, just to end on a slightly more broad note. So I think one thing that we can conclude from this uh, is that colonial states in Africa, they were not up to the task. And so they, they had their aims, they had their goals. They wanted uh, Nigeria to, to be the sole supplier of Nigeria, uh, of, of Lancashire, but they had no idea to how to achieve it. So they, they were facing all sorts of bottlenecks of which the seasonality bottleneck, which I mentioned uh, at the end of my pre presentation was a major one. And they were not able to overcome these bottlenecks. They, they were not able to uh, increase the yields. Uh, they were not able to provide African producers with decent prices. And as a result of that, this uh, uh, policy of cotton imperialism was not successful. And as a consequence of that, only in a very limited number of well-endowed regions, of which Uganda is the main example, as well as in isolated regions where cotton could be effectively imposed, was cotton produced in sizable quantities before uh, 1960. And then I would also say, and this is perhaps a little bit more controversial, but I would say, if cotton was adopted in, in, in poor places, yeah, in these isolated places, as well as in places with very specific, very beneficial resource endowments as, uh, like Uganda, I think we must also uh, rethink uh, the causality between poverty and cotton. And uh, the idea of Becker that cotton was a major driver of Africa's underdevelopment, I think is not borne out by the arguments and uh, the facts. Now, I'm still working on this topic. Uh, I'm currently going back to Uganda post-COVID. I can do my research and I'm very excited about that. And I'm working with uh, a colleague from Gulu University, a geographer. And uh, what I'm currently doing is I'm trying to map all the cotton generies that ever existed in uh, Uganda, their coordinates, their characteristics. We're going to do some field work uh, across Uganda and, and hopefully generate a, a database with the locations of these, uh, these cotton generies. And that's going to then be an input for uh, a new set of research papers, which I, I hope to publish in the, in the coming years. And I want to thank you for your uh, attention and for your attention span as well, uh, which is all my, uh, my fault. So, so thank you for, for sticking with me uh, for all that time.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dehas. Um, excellent, intriguing. Um, I'm hoping that you are not trying to make people like uh, Walter Rodney turn in their graves. <laughs> okay, um, so without much ado, um, we'll hand over to the discussant, uh, Dr. Simon Tabashuka, who is with us here uh, in the smart room in the physical audience. So over to you. Dr. Simon Tabajuka. Thank you. Um, Mikhail. <laughs> Thank you, Mikhail. Mikhail uh, asks uh, for this uh, very um, intriguing and uh, in many respects um, uh, new thoughts about uh, how to revisit and uh, try to um, understand what uh, many have referred to as the tensions in the empire, tensions in colonialism. And um, um, well, I'll start by really um, congratulating you on um, uh, the amount of work, the um, research that uh, you have um, so far done in order to um, make us think again about um, um, about uh, imperialism, not in um, its general terms, but uh, to begin to look at uh, specifics. Uh, here are two men of us in our studies of uh, imperialism, uh, we, we've been taking raw materials as uh, um, a kind of uh, in a plural, you know, in a, um, together we talk about imperialism, extractive raw materials, but, um, um, uh, although you, maybe you will have to uh, uh, deal with that, the justification for singling out cotton, probably not coffee and so on, but nevertheless, singling out a single um, commodity and interrogating um, the history of that commodity, in this case, cotton, looking at uh, ways in which cotton could or uh, might have even in some respects been uh, exaggerated in terms of the way uh, imperial, um, imperial pursuits surrounding it were, you know, actually unfolded. And um, yes, you, you start from uh, uh, quite far from the American war of independence, its impact. You go to um, uh, British India, you go to, you come to Africa and uh, you uh, make a case in the literature about uh, colonialism, justification and what have you. And then uh, you, uh, you, you show with the, uh, 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 specific uh, information in terms of statistics, in terms of figures, how uh, the fortunes of cotton in Africa itself. And um, uh, in doing that, of course, you touch on uh, the natural resources, climate conditions, on labor. And uh, uh, you conclude by uh, really trying to push us back to uh, look at 
natural conditions as um, a major explanation of um, um, why cotton did well in certain places and didn't in certain time uh, in in others in um, uh, across uh, Africa. Um, then uh, you seem to really want to put a premium on seasonality. And uh, um, here, uh, I, I can see uh, the import of this um, uh, with the potential, the potential it has as an economic historian to contribute to an unfolding debate on, um, on, on um, um, how natural conditions are affecting the way we live and uh, so on. But uh, I have uh, some concern here, which is about uh, agency. Uh, where do you locate agency in this seasonality? And uh, whether uh, before uh, its fortunes turn around, you see the place of indigenous knowledge, African indigenous knowledge um, uh, into play, or, uh, well, let me throw in something small here. Uh, could this be a, a restatement of comparative advantage framework back into, um, uh, throwing it back in, um, uh, which um, uh, seemed to have um, uh, run uh, its course. Um, I'm also intrigued by your arguments about um, um, the, 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 what seems to be contrary to uh, received wisdom about uh, the role of colonies as uh, enclaves of exploitation by the specific uh, metropoles that colonized them. Uh, you seem to actually suggest, I think with evidence that uh, um, uh, controlling a colony did not uh, bestow very specific uh, benefits all of the time uh, that were artists and tans because uh, if we take the uh, metropole as a block, there was competition within. And uh, I, I, I agree with you. But then uh, I'm not sure about the role of India as a player in terms of where cotton was heading. Uh, wasn't uh, British capital still active in, in India, in the colonial India at the time? Uh, you know, the, in the 19th, the, the early 20th century that uh, you begin with, um, you, uh, uh, and so on. Um, overall, I think I agree with you that uh, cotton was overtaken. For example, in Uganda, it was overtaken by, by um, coffee pretty early in uh, the colonial period by the 1930s. And I think um, you probably want to find an explanation for that. Um, uh, well, I'm not very familiar with the literature on uh, West Africa, but uh, so far I think uh, what you bring on board is extremely important and, um, and, and uh, really very useful. So I see your work as um, a uh, very deliberate uh, intervention in fracturing what seems to be a smooth and um, um, an interrupted uh, forward march of imperialism uh, in the plural uh, to say, well, um, there they were um, drivers and some of the drivers that uh, uh, we believed were at the core uh, had their own problems. And that's why you find that uh, uh, contrary to what was built as a panacea in this imperial 
or forward much, cotton had uh, all of these challenges that he, uh, uh, you, you, you bring in. But uh, as I conclude uh, my um, uh, uh, remarks, um, your um, thoughts about coercion are equally intriguing, but uh, um, uh, my question is about uh, controlling for cotton and um, labor, but uh, how about uh, other possible sources of income? Um, and then in Mozambique, which became a very important source of migrant labor in South African mines. When did uh, that uh, migration begin? And why wasn't it uh, an alternative to um, cotton growing so that uh, coercion becomes pronounced with uh, the uh, checkered outcomes that uh, uh, you point out? Overall, uh, uh, Mikhail, I, I think uh, this is very, very welcome. And I congratulate you uh, this far. And I recommend this work uh, for historians, uh, particularly in Uganda here, to uh, really look at it very critically and uh, join the conversation. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Simon Tabajuka. Um, there you have it, uh, Dr. Dihas. Um, so you might want to take um, a few minutes to respond to the discussions, comments, and questions, after which we shall open the discussion to the rest of the audience, uh, those physically here with me and those online. And um, those of you online, feel free to use the chat option to type in your questions and comments, but we shall also give you the opportunity to ask your question if you so wish. Over now to you, Mickey. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. And um, a hi to Edgar. I cannot see you in the in screen. Let's see that you're also here. And then thanks for, 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 for co-organizing. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruta Bajuka. Uh, thank you, Simon, for, for these really great uh, and, and thoughtful comments, which I think really, I, I'm very happy to hear you say these things because it, it, it shows to me that you've engaged with my work and that, that I, I've been able to convey to you the kind of points that, that I want to discuss and, and talk about with my, with my peers in, in academia. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're bringing up uh, uh, some of these points that, that you've brought up. And I, I will try, I will attempt to, to say something useful in return, uh, not so much to retort or uh, uh, get the initiative back, uh, but just to, to try to further the discussion uh, a little bit more. Um, so so let, me, let me just go over them uh, and, and let me try to make, not take too much time because I'm also very keen to hear uh, others uh, in the audience. Um, so your first point is, is, is I think, a very, uh, a very crucial one, where you say, well, uh, when, when we talk about um, uh, colonialism, imperialism, we tend to think of raw materials. Uh, and, and you're basically asking me, what, what happens if you single out uh, cotton? Uh, so so how, how does that affect uh, the, 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 the well-received uh, story? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very fair point to make. Uh, if you look at uh, Nigeria, for example, you see that uh, uh, northern Nigerian farmers actually rejected cotton, most of them. There was some cotton production from the, from, from, from the north western part of uh, northern Nigeria, but most, the, by far the most important crop that was exported from Nigeria was, was groundnuts. Uh, and uh, of course, that then one could say, well, you know, if you, if you look at all commodities together and not just cotton, then, then we still have the classical story where, uh, uh, where a colonizer exports uh, a raw material to, uh, to, to, to the colonizer. Um, and, and that's, yeah, I think a point that, that I have thought about, and, and I certainly have some, some, some thoughts about this, but I think I, I, I need to find a way to, to sort of uh, weave this a little bit more explicitly into my, uh, into my argument. So that, that's a point well taken. 
Um, although I can, I can already say that, you know, when you talk about agency, uh, there, there's clearly some agency there. And the agency in this case is that a Nigerian farmer said no to cotton, a Nigerian trader said no to cotton, and they said yes to groundnuts. Uh, and so, so they were producing a raw material, but there was clearly a, a, a preference here for, for another crop. Uh, and as you rightly point out, that, that also happens in, in central, in southern Uganda. Uh, I, I would say that if you look at Uganda as a whole, uh, uh, coffee only takes over in the late 1940s, maybe even in the 1950s. Uh, but certainly if you look at Uganda, if you look at central Uganda, then, then uh, coffee already begins to take over in, in the 1930s, as you, uh, as you rightly point out. Uh, and what this, this shows uh, clearly is uh, a degree of agency by uh, by 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 farmers to to make their own choices about the type of crop they want to produce, uh, and basically override uh, and not only expectations but also efforts by colonizers to uh, to export a different uh, crop. And this especially applies to Nigeria. In Uganda, this sort of single-minded uh, focus on, on cotton was much less uh, pronounced, which is exactly one of the reasons why I find it so interesting that Uganda, of all places, became. Uh, Africa's major uh, cotton exporter. Uh, I should say Sub-Saharan Africa's major cotton exporter because Egypt uh, uh, was uh, more important in terms of quantities. Um, yeah, and, and, and so your comment about uh, trying to sort of uh, uh, bring out the importance of natural uh, conditions, uh, that's absolutely correct. That, that is very much what I'm trying to do. Uh, but I also think bringing those up uh, helps us to, to, to think about colonialism in a different way. Because if you, if you can show, and, and I think I show this in my uh, 2021 paper that, that you have read, um, uh, Mr. Ruta Bajuka, if, if you look at that paper, um, you can see that, that natural conditions are decisive, right? And, and what that implies is that colonizers were not able to overcome those natural conditions. They, they were a bottleneck, uh, they were a constraint, a constraining factor. And that, that tells us something about colonialism. It tells us something about, the, the, in a way, the impotence uh, and the, the inability of colonizers to, 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 get, uh, to get what they want in, 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 in their African colonies. And I think that, that is a very interesting line of thinking uh, on which we, we can continue a little bit more uh, in, as historians. Um, yeah, and then that also ties in with your questions about agency, seasonality, indigenous knowledge. Um, uh, yeah, so um, maybe if indigenous knowledge had been harnessed more effectively, uh, these projects would have been more successful. But this is for me now, uh, it's a conjecture, it's, it's a speculation because I, I haven't really gone into that uh, much uh, as of yet. Uh, yes, and, and, and yeah, I mean, you, you simply made a comment that uh, colonies are often viewed as, 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 as enclaves of exploitation. Uh, and, and I kind of question that a little bit. And I say, well, simply maintaining these colonies and, and, uh, and, and uh, funding them, uh, financing them, uh, was all, often already uh, something that required a lot of effort and, and, and also, in many cases, a considerable, considerable amount of coercion. Uh, and I think you, you make a point that uh, I was slightly worried you would make, uh, and it's, it's entirely correct, and that is about India, right? So if this cotton is going to India, by the way, a, a substantial amount of it at some point was also going to Japan, and Japan is clearly outside the uh, British uh, sphere of influence. But one could say India, well, that's still a, a place where British capital is, is located, and it's still within the British imperial uh, sphere. And this is actually one sort of a thread of my argument that I'm still exploring in more detail at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to have a coffee tomorrow with one of the most, uh, uh, basically the number one expert on this topic, uh, Tirtanka Roy, uh, an Indian economic historian. And I will certainly make sure to, to ask him uh, all I can ask him about uh, the, uh, the Indian textile sector uh, before uh, we finish our coffee. Uh, but I already have a sense uh, that this is not really a story of uh, cotton being diverted to uh, British capitalists in India. Uh, so the, much of this cotton is actually funneled into going into Indian, Indian textile uh, manufacturing, which is at this specific juncture in time, beginning to revive after a century of the industrialization. Uh, but I think it's a very important angle that I need to, to cover to sort of tie up my, my argument. So uh, uh, well spotted, thank you. Um, 
Uh, then I'm going to just very briefly respond to one final point you made about uh, coercion and, and other sources of income. And then you mentioned, uh, you had a specific question about labor migration from uh, Mozambique to South Africa. Um, well, in my understanding, most of the labor migrants in, uh, from Mozambique are actually coming from the, from the south uh, of the country. Of course, Mozambique is, is absolutely huge. Uh, it's very large. Um, but I think Mozambique kind of has, has three different sort of uh, economies uh, within itself. Uh, it, it has yeah, sort of a European driven plantation economy in the south. Uh, then there's a bit of a, a labor migration zone in the middle and then in the north. You have these concessionary companies uh, which are trying to, in this period, mostly uh, uh, extract cotton. Uh, so I think these, these cotton schemes in Mozambique are mostly located in this northern part of the, the country, and the labor migration is mostly going coming from the uh, from the south. Um, and and I want to end maybe with one very interesting observation about uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, because what you see there is that in in the period before 1960, cotton fails; it doesn't succeed. Um, and uh, um, then after 1960, it takes off. Uh, I've shown this in, in, in a graph. And uh, one would think perhaps that before 1960, instead of growing cotton, people would, would migrate. And then after 1960, they, uh, they would stop migrating and they would start, start growing cotton. But you actually see the exact opposite. So in this, in this area, you see that before 1960, cotton fills and migration happens. But after 1960, cotton increases and migration increases as well. So the number of people that are actually moving out of this area, especially to Cote d'Ivoire, which has a vibrant cocoa sector in the post-colonial period, uh, increases sharply. Uh, and, and I would say that the only plausible explanation for this is that uh, the, the cotton sector becomes a lot more productive. Uh, new varieties are introduced, herbicides are being used, plows are being uh, used, food crop varieties also uh, increase substantially in, in terms of yields, which simply means that people have more productive capacity and that this um, natural resource of their, or this, this uh, um, uh, you called it uh, natural condition constraint that existed before uh, was actually finally overcome. So thank you again for your comments and, and I'm open to the floor. Right, thank you so much. Um, so, the conversation is now open to the rest of us. And so feel free to raise your hand. You can use the raise your hand function those online. And then for my physical audience, I'll be looking at you. And actually, I think, Mikhail, you can see all of us. And at the end of this open conversation, I'll hand over to um, the de facto chair of the meeting who has joined us. I indicated at the beginning that I'm sitting in for my colleague, Dr. Edgar Taylor, who has joined us. So much later, he'll be closing this meeting. But let me use the advantage of being the chair and ask um, um, my questions or make my comments. So this is quite intriguing for me. And I will start off with what I, like a question that I, like had Dr. Uh, Simon mentioned, or probably not, like he seemed to ask, why did you choose to focus on cotton and not on other commodities uh, associated with uh, imperialism? And so for instance, coffee or minerals uh, to make your argument. Um, but beyond that, Going back now to my own um, questions. So we are talking about imperialism. Now, if we talk about imperialism, then colonialism. So if we agree that colonialism was a stage in imperialism, then we also have to mention neocolonialism. Then if colonialism then is imperialism and cotton was as a commodity was introduced by colonialists, which is true, then does it not become a tool of imperialism? Should we really be asking the question whether it succeeded or failed, but it was a tool that we shouldn't be 
debating about it. And that looking at it in the economic sense, which you are doing, uh, might actually be a limiting factor. But if we understand cotton as a tool of colonial control, of, of imperial control, that colonialists use it to control, to extract, to manage a colony, for instance, Uganda, then we bet get more better nuances about this commodity called cotton. That cotton helped the colonial government to monetize these colonies, to tax these colonies, including labor. That's, that forced free labor is taxation, is a way of taxation. And so if we look at, um, cotton in that way, then that question of whether it was imperialism or not, and whether it materialized or not, to me then that question becomes redundant. Earlier in your opening um, comments, you talked about the moral justification uh, when you uh, gesture to legitimate trade. Actually, I would look at it as the immoral justification. Some people have argued that um, when we talk about legitimate trade, the African was actually enslaved in Africa. So it was not about ending enslavement, but actually keeping it here in Africa because people um, were giving, were forced to go and work, to do that, to, grow, to go and work, including growing cotton. And so some would argue differently. Um, okay, I don't want to monopolize um, as the chair. And then lastly, you talked about metropole, but in terms of colonialism, in terms of the colony, and the colonizer, the colonized and the colonizer, um, you would correct me here, and colleagues can also correct me here. Could we not usefully talk about the metropole um, and then the satellite economy when we have independence? That after independence, we can usefully talk about, you can usefully use those terms of metropole and uh, the periphery after independence. And so that way we can have useful comparisons and then conclusions. But I must add my voice to Dr. Simon that your approach uh, of looking at cotton as a commodity and raising all those questions is a new one, is a good one, interesting one, and is helping us to have new conversations and new debates. Thank you so much. Um, you might want to take like um, three, four more people and then um, you respond to them. But if you choose to respond to one at a go, you are welcome to do that. So let me know what you prefer. Uh, I guess I, I'll, I'll respond to your comments and then I will open the floor and then we'll, we'll start bundling them. All right, no problem. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. So, so I mean, this is food for thought, right? So, your your comments are are critical comments, reflective comments, um, theoretical comments as well. Um, I mean, yes, eh, colonialism as as a stage in in imperialism, it, it it it's a useful way actually of thinking about this because the the narrative that I'm that I'm proposing here uh, uh, it involves uh, the, the pre-colonial pre period, the time before uh, the scrambled territories that were not under de facto European occupation, uh, then it, it, it very much centers on the colonial era. But there's also a bit of the story, which, uh, which I did not expand on a lot here, which goes beyond the colonial period. And then we're especially looking at uh, the former French colonies, where we see a cotton takeoff now, and, and this is definitely something that we should see in light of this this long run uh, uh, imperialism, and and of course what many have referred to as new French neo colonialism in uh, in West Africa. So, 
I think this is this is potentially a useful way of, of looking at it. Uh, but then you you expanded more and 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 you said well cotton was introduced by colonialists um, and then you 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 try yeah you you, you sort of developed an argument that yeah, it became a tool of of imperial uh, uh, control it was used and you said to monetize the economy to tax the economy um, and I, I would like to say two things about that I, my first point would be no actually three uh, things uh, let me see if I I'm not thinking too fast and then I'll forget about it. Uh, that would be a waste. Um, yes, I remember my three points. Uh, so the first one I would say, I mean, cotton was not introduced by Europeans in, uh, in Africa, unlike cocoa, for example, in Ghana, cotton existed, but you, you do have a point because um, uh, the varieties that were uh, used for exports, for example, the Allen variety, uh, which came from the United States, uh, was actually introduced in uh, into uh, into Africa. Although, if I'm not mistaken, maybe the American varieties even had some sort of more ancient African uh, roots. But I, I would have to look that up. Uh, there's a very fascinating history of, of cotton breeding and varieties. It's a very complex crop. Uh, it's like uh, Matoka. It's like the banana. There's so many different types. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But it's not really my topic of expertise. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'd be willing to buy that. I would be willing under certain conditions to say, yes, Europeans introduced it. Uh, and then I would also agree with you that it was used in a variety of ways, right? Uh, and, and you mentioned taxation, monetization, but there was also even, you know, disciplining of people. Uh, you, you, it was also used as a tool to, to, make, to make Africans work because there was, of course, this, this very racist idea that, that you needed to make people uh, industrious because they wouldn't be industrious otherwise. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right that, that cotton was definitely uh, framed within, within that context. But my, my, my point would be that that is all true, but it's not cotton imperialism, right? It's a different type of motivation. Uh, it's it's, it's more, a lot more to do with, with, with local dynamics, with uh, actually uh, the, the running of a colony, the financing of a colony, uh, the, the, the disciplining of a population in a colony, uh, that explains these projects, and, and that is kind of a different take, I would say, than the original argument of cotton imperialism, the economic argument, which is a lot more about um, trade uh, between the, the colony uh, and the metropole. So, uh, yeah, I, I would second it, but I would kind of try to fold it into my uh, into my argument. Um, yeah, and, and and the legitimate trade. I mean, I, I was I was being a historian here, right? So when I call it a moral justification, I'm not saying that the moral justification is actually moral, uh, but it was a moral justification, right? So it was used in that way. So it was used as a way to, to sort of kind of convince people that this was an appropriate agenda, right? It was used in a way to to garner support uh, among missionary movements, for example, uh, and it was a way to yeah, one could say to kind of mesh uh, the 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 the, the uh, the, the, the economic side of imperialism uh, with more of like winning the hearts and minds in Europe uh, 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 approach to, to imperialism, which as we know was, was, was prevalent in those, uh, in those days. Um, so that, that was the point I was, I was trying to, uh, to make there. And then, and then a final point, and then I'm gonna give it back to the floor um, is about, um, yeah, so, so when you make the point that so, when something is introduced by colonialism, colonialist it becomes a tool of um, um, of imperial control I, I mean I think and, and I, I'm sure you would agree with me that this is not always the case right I mean simply look at the history of, of Christianity in uh, in Africa which uh, in, in many places uh, such as Uganda was was introduced by Europeans uh, there's no questions about uh, question about that uh, but within a matter of decades it was also used against Europeans right uh, and so I think when when you introduce something, uh, people appropriate it and, and people use it and people subvert it and, and they start doing all sorts of things. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that is uh, uh, important to remember. And, and, and what you are reminding me of is to also question the history of cotton along those lines, right? Uh, to, 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 to sort of make that parallel and also think about how um, uh, yeah, to, in what ways was cotton used? In what ways was it subverted? In what ways was it was it used? And I mean, it, it's not just 
resistance. It's not just uh, oppositional uh, uh, agency, right? There are also other types of agency. There are also, you know, people can also use it to um, uh, to, to to save money, uh, uh, to uh, acquire wealth, uh, to send their their children to school. So I think we need to, when we when we talk about agency, we need to be careful that agency is is, is not always oppositional. It's not always against uh, colonizers. I, I do not think that all Ugandans were constantly thinking about how they were going to subvert the colonial state, right? So they, they were using the means at their disposal of which cotton was one uh, to achieve their own ends uh, in, in, in life. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my response and, and thanks again. Thank you. Um, I have two questions from uh, our online audience. Yusuf Kasumba. Yusuf, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yusuf, can you, Yusuf Kasumba, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, Chris, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I just wanted to thank uh, Hass for his uh, presentation. And I, I only add my voice to your concerns and Dr. Utavajuka's concerns uh, about the new revelations regarding cotton imperialism. Well, my question is uh, very simple and I've put it on the floor. Uh, does this then reflect uh, Benjamin Disrael's argument that uh, uh, colonialism was not uh, uh, intended for profit, but it was a source of a loss and he called it, uh, called colonies millstones around the necks of colonizers. Uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, get clarification uh, from us whether this presentation is not taking us to the direction of uh, uh, rethinking uh, our opinions about colonialism in its entirety. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, Agatha Alidri, Dr. Alidri, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Haas, for the presentation. It was indeed so enriching. Mine was an observation about cotton imperialism. Indeed, I was saying cotton imperialism took place and it still exists. What I only wanted to bring up was in your methodology of this study, we needed to go further to disaggregate the study because the impact of cotton imperialism, for instance, in Uganda, varied from one region to another. It was not uniform. For instance, cotton imperialism was more intense in the north. And then while in the central, it took another, in the eastern region, it took another direction. And in West Nile, it also took another direction. So you needed to further disaggregate than aggregating the whole study under Uganda as one. And then similarly, I was also arguing that you needed to ask the question, in whose interest was cotton being introduced as a cash crop? During the colonial period, it was referred to as a revolution. But in whose interest and service was it being introduced? You realize that this was at a time when there was a crisis. You rightly mentioned there was a crisis back in America, back in, U in Europe, where the ball warm af affected the cotton, and that also affected the, the yields. So quickly, America and Europe had to come to Africa as an alternative place. So you need to, that was well brought up. Then the seasonality also made that to be introduced. Unlike other places, Africa, most of Africa has two seasons and that was so conducive for cotton production and that also enhanced cotton imperial, imperialism. Who determined the price? 
in whose market was it being sold? All those are forms of imperialism. Whereas Africa, whereas in Uganda, there was no cohesion, di direct cohesion. There was an indirect cohesion through forced labor and, uh, and taxes. So the African was forced to grow cotton in order to pay the taxes. And in whose interest were, were the taxes being paid? In the interest of the colonial government. And that explains why today there's a lot of resistance in certain regions to cotton growing, meaning Africans are beginning to become empowered and liberated economically. They can now make decisions either to grow cotton or neglect it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Agatha, um, Edgar, and Nicholas uh, Mubarak, and then William. Okay, so. Uh, a bunch of questions from the physical audience for you, Mikhail. So here we go. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, thank you uh, and apologies for uh, coming in late. I was actually at the Benedicto Chiwanuka Memorial Lecture where the president was the speaker. And uh, one of the things he celebrated about himself was that, well, we first, speaking of his cohort, political cohort, we first had to solve the economic problem. Now we can get around to thinking about independence of the judiciary and other things, but we first had to solve the economic problem, which was uh, essentially what he, he argued was promoting investment and um, uh, empowering the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. But we know that systems, that economic systems and drivers uh, are um, more enduring than political uh, agents have control over. And so it goes back to, you know, I think um, to Dr. Ruta Bajuka's point and also following on, I think Dr. Alidri's very important point here about that cotton, cotton had a different impact in different places and that the factors were not always environmental. So I'm thinking here of Grace Carswell's work on Kigezi where she argues you know, to simplify that it was not an environmental factors that shaped uh, the low uptake of, of cash crops, but it was the way that Kigezi farmers understood what success meant and that they had a very different, British officials had a very difficult time imposing uh, a monetary um, view of what uh, economic su success meant that they viewed it in terms of exchange of food crops and other things that the British did not um, weren't able to tax. Uh, so I wonder how basically it's asking you to respond to the cultural historian argument that uh, that's basically the question. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, maybe I'll just stop there. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edgar. So Mubarak, your question. Thank you, Chef. Mine also uh, is brief. Uh, I had the presenter. Uh, giving uh, a kind of example from Northern Nigeria. Uh, I wanted him to maybe think of uh, how this cotton uh, imperialism uh, brought the emergence of some certain merchant bourgeois within the society. Because I- Could you, could you repeat the, the, the last part of your question? How it introduced? It, how it gave birth to some certain merchant bourgeois bourgeois within the uh, the like cotton buyers or yeah, like, okay. are they agent like that because yeah. with many people there uh, who became rich as a result of this cotton, I understand. cotton mm -hmm. issues then you talk about the issue of textile industries uh, currently i can say that in the whole of northern nigeria cutting industries are dates except maybe I can see in Fontua, then the, even the famous textiles that were been established by the colonialists in Kaduna are already dead. So what do you think brought this, the issue of the death of the, the pro, 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 progression of these uh, textile industries? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Mubarak, Nicholas. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, the background to my question has been uh, provided very well by Dr. Taylor, but I am uh, going to ask 
the very last part and so I will take one minute. So um, about the failure of cotton uh, as the result of season and uh, environmental factors. What do you say about its failure as a result of the rational choice of say uh, low costs of, pro of uh, production of coffee compared to cotton across uh, those comparative areas you have uh, really studied? Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. William? Thank you so much, Dr. Bihaz. Um, my concern is on uh, uh, cotton growing in Busoga. Uh, the area which I'm studying about uh, in my PhD. And since you have uh, uh, also uh, worked on Uganda, I think this would be very, very important if you actually uh, see how to integrate it in your work. Um, there was this scenario in the early days of colonial rule in Busoga when Western education was introduced specifically for the chiefs and for the sons of chiefs. Now, for the people of Usoga, in order to be able to, to, to participate in this education, each family was required by law to have two gardens of, uh, of cotton. One garden, the proceeds from uh, one garden were to help the that or to enable the, 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 the father or the, 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 the family head to pay graduate tax. And then the proceeds from the second garden were all uh, given to the colonial or paid to the colonial authorities under the pretext of uh, 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 the, the local people's uh, uh, funding the education of their chiefs who were studying in Uganda schools. Now, when these chiefs uh, finished actually the education upon, uh, upon going back to, to, to Busoga, they actually did not implement the interests of the local people who had paid for the education, but they actually uh, uh, promoted the interests of the colonial government. So I don't know how you are going to, to, to think about this, how the people, uh, the indigenous people themselves were forced to grow cotton to sustain the education of, of their oppressors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. And the kind of anecdotal um, evidence, if you like. So in Ankole, it is said that when uh, people are given cotton seeds to grow, they roasted them and then actually planted them but of course they never grew and that was enough evidence to those enforcing cotton growing in the region that it actually couldn't do well in the region and that explains at least from that piece of evidence why cotton was never grown in that region in Angkole. over to you Mikhail. thank you thank you very much um i'm just quickly going to write down uh, what you just said because I will certainly forget once I get into answering all these uh, these questions. Um, okay, so so let let me just start by by saying that that I'm I'm, I'm very excited and, and very pleased and, and honored actually that uh, that I've received these these questions. Um, I think uh, they, they bring, bring up a, a lot of, of important topics and I also see some clear connections between the different uh, questions and, and I hope uh, as I get to answering them now that I, I can make some of these, these connections and, and draw some of them uh, together in my, uh, in my answers. So let me uh, start by answering uh, Yusuf uh, Kasumba's question. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, your name correctly. Um, uh, so, so, so Am I willing to go as far as to say that colonies were a burden rather than a source of income for the colonizers? Uh, my argument is no, uh, or my, my answer is no, I, I wouldn't be willing to go this far. 
um, I would uh, I would say that that it's a it's it's a fragmented uh, story. Uh, it's a complex story. Uh, it's a story that's a lot more straightforward than the classical, you know, cotton imperialism uh, argument or the the classical economic colonialism uh, argument. Um, but it's it's not a dichotomy. It's not that either. Uh, yes, uh, it's true that uh, eh, that Europe industrialized uh, because of the the raw materials that were exported from uh, uh, from Africa, or uh, that instead the colonies were simply a burden. I mean, I, I think I mentioned uh, uh, two examples, and I can add a third one uh, now in my answer. Um, uh, and the first one would be that. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the idea was, was certainly that, that uh, cotton that was being sent to the European colonies would perhaps not spur industrialization, but that at least it would um, uh, help sunset industries, industries that were actually on the decline to maintain their employment, right? So in a way, it was a way to actually prop up uh, the working classes in, uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, and, and maybe even more the working classes and the capitalists actually. Uh, so I think this is, this is one interesting thought uh, eh, that this is not a story of of of, uh, of, of capitalism per se uh, but if we look at the labor movement in europe uh, they were actually the ones who were most supportive of uh, of cotton imperialists uh, imperialism they they wanted actually these types of policy to be implemented and what happened in, in britain for example in the 1920s is that all the textile producers were actually forced by the state to chip into a fund that would uh, finance these, these cotton projects uh, in the colonies. Uh, and, and this was actually from a perspective of, of, of employment. Now, I've also mentioned the Portuguese colonies, right? So in the Portuguese case, when we look at cotton, yes, we, we do see a more straightforward uh, form of economic colonialism there. And thirdly, I would say that uh, uh, even if um, the economic activities in the colonies do not directly benefit the metropole, uh, if, if there's no transfer of funds from the colony to the metropole, and there are plenty of cases of colonialism where this actually happened, but also plenty of cases where it did not. Of course, there's still the thing that the bureaucracy in the colony is still manned by people from Europe, right? So you have a sizable number of uh, colonial officials whose salaries are being paid and who, whose careers are, are being funded by the work of the peasant in the field, right? So uh, there, there are certainly all sorts of uh, benefits uh, that are going on and that are important to unpick, but it's not a simple story. That, that is what I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to do here. Now, the second uh, set of comments, and I, uh, uh, I only remember the name uh, Alidri, uh, so I hope that's, that's an appropriate way of uh, addressing you. Uh, you made a, a great point that, of course, we do need to uh, disaggregate uh, further and that the impact is not uh, uniform. Now, my, my own interest in, 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 the, in the history of cotton mostly goes out to uh, uh, what used to be called the, the Tesso district. So this is also where I've spoken to a lot of elderly uh, cotton farmers. Uh, and there's some great work on the Tesso region. Uh, Carol Summers has a, has a very interesting paper on, on, on coercion in this region. Uh, there is a book by an anthropologist, uh, Joe and Vincent, uh, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there's also an agriculture historian, uh, uh, Vail, who also has a fascinating analysis of, of, of Tesso. So I, I, am, uh, I have more to say about it, but you know, when, you, when you try to make an argument this big, you, you have to so, at some point stop uh, being more specific. But if I would apply my arguments to Uganda, I would say that uh, Eastern Uganda probably had higher levels of coercion than, than Uganda did. And, and I think the explanation for this is it fits in very well with, with my discussion of coercion earlier on, uh, namely that there were, there were fewer alternatives, uh, alternative income sources in, uh, in Eastern Uganda. Uh, and perhaps there was also a slightly higher uh, degree of uh, isolation because uh, people from, from, from the Tesso district uh, uh, and also from what at the time used to be called uh, the Bukedi district and the Bukwere district, there were many district uh, uh, changes then, uh, they were not so much involved in labor migration. Uh, there was labor migration, but not so much. So the, 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 the degree of external options was, was lower, which uh, if you follow my hypothesis would then lead to more coercion, which I think is, is also what we, what we see happening here. Although the level of coercion is again on a different level from what we see in Mozambique, what we see in Chad, what we see in the Belgian uh, Congo. Um, 
Yeah, so and I think your, your other points yeah, about taxation, uh, about the question who, in whose interest was Cotton introduced in Uganda, I think they tie in a little bit with, with my, my answer to uh, Yusuf's uh, question. So I, I hope I have addressed that uh, to some extent. Then uh, um, uh, Edgar, um, yeah, so, so what, uh, what your president said today is, is very similar to what his ambassador in the Netherlands told me uh, uh, and, and an audience here uh, about a month ago. Uh, it's interesting, he, the, the, uh, the Dutch ambassador, the Ugandan ambassador to the Netherlands is actually a Dutch lady uh, who married to one of the, uh, the, the men who, who fought in the bush in, 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 uh, back in the, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, I think he has died by now, but she has uh, changed her uh, nationality to, uh, to Ugandan. Uh, so she's, uh, I think, one of the few Dutch people who actually has become uh, Ugandan and is now commissioned to be the ambassador in the Netherlands, but that's just a side story. Your point was about uh, Grace Carswell's argument. Now, I, 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 I'm not very convinced by, uh, by, by Grace Carswell, and that's for, for, for a very simple reason. Uh, if you look at the economy of, uh, of, of Kigezi district at the time, as it was called, that, then you see two things. Uh, one thing is that people produce food crops and sell them as cash crops, right? So that's, that's the point that she really, I think, pursues uh, in, in one of her articles, food crops as cash crops. But if you look at the, uh, the income that people were getting from those food crops as cash crops, it's actually not so high. It is, it is quite marginal uh, compared to what, for example, a farmer in Busoga would earn from growing pots. And now the taxes were also slightly lower in, uh, in Kigezi, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, the food crops that were sold, and of course are still sold uh, to a very large extent today, if you drive through, I, you know, I, I, the, the, I, I remember seeing um, onions everywhere uh, along the roadside. Uh, but but at, the, at the time, the value of those food crops was, 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 was clearly smaller than, than what uh, the, the value of the cash crops in, in, in Uganda's main cotton growing uh, regions. But the point that she completely seems to sort of gloss over is that people were also heavily involved in labor migration. So uh, Kigezi was by far, I think, the most migratory district in Uganda. Uh, and, and, and why do people migrate? Why do they move in very large numbers to, to, to Uganda to actually, among other things, work on, on the cotton and the, and the coffee fields? Because they, they, they want or they need income, right? So I think the behavior of, uh, of, of, of people in, in the far south uh, uh, west of Uganda and their economic behavior was not, a, not at all different from, from what we see in the, in the cash crop regions. Uh, but for them, it turns out that, that cotton is just not, it's not paying. And well, I think she mentions flax, I think she mentions coffee, uh, not so much cotton, but the, the, the kind of cash crops that Europeans tried in this region, they didn't grow very well. And I think this, again, with yeah, this fits in with my argument because the, the ecology was, a, was, was, not, uh, uh, was not suitable for the types of crops that, that Europeans uh, had in mind. Now about the, the decline of the textile industries in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, I would say that I would, I would uh, uh, suggest that you, you look at a recent book by uh, uh, my former colleague, uh, uh, Catherine Frederick, uh, and I think it's called Twilight of an Industry. It's actually about textile sectors in, in East Africa, which has a very nice comparative chapter uh, about East and West Africa. And you might be able to find some, uh, some clues there. Uh, and and I'm, I have to be modest here. I, I could now, you know, come up with an answer, but it's a little bit outside of my uh, area of expertise. So uh, feel free to, to shoot an email, and we can we can try to start up a conversation. But but I, I'm going to um, to be short about that now, uh, and get to the the question by by Nicholas about uh, coffee versus uh, cotton uh, being a, a rational choice by uh, by by farmers. Um, I mean, I, I think this is uh, this is correct. Uh, coffee is a, is, a, is a crop that you, you, so the difference between cotton and coffee is that in coffee you have to invest, you have to plant it and you have to wait for three to five years because, before it starts really yielding any return before you can actually harvest uh, the crop. And, uh, and to be able to do that, you need to have secure land rights. Yeah? If you're going to be thrown off your land, you're not going to wait for three to five years. So you first need to have secure land rights. So if you're a migrant, for example, and you just want to wait, be there for one season, you're, you're not going to plant coffee. Uh, you also uh, need to have the ability to, to sort of uh, postpone your consumption for five years or three years. So you, you first have to make an investment and then you have to wait before anything comes in. And if you're very poor, 
uh, th this is this is not easy for people to do. So to be able to grow coffee, you need to have some savings, some funds uh, to be able to uh, to put in the labor, to spend your labor time, not directly get an income from it and uh, postpone it for for a couple of years. Uh, and, and I think this this transition from cotton to coffee in Uganda is, is a very fascinating one about which quite a lot has been written, uh, but more work uh, could be be done about it. And and I think I I fully agree that this was a rational choice. And I I don't think it necessarily uh, uh, well sort of uh, is there's a tension between between that uh, statement and and my focus on uh, uh, on environmental factors because. Uh, and so well, I'm focusing mostly on, on the conditions and the context, but of course, uh, for that to translate into an outcome, there are people in between and those people have to make decisions and choices, right? And if the environmental conditions are not good, people are quite likely to make a, a different type of choice. If they have to grow their food and cash crops in one season, they're quite likely in their own interest, in their own rational interest or using their agency or no matter how you want to call it, they will likely make a different choice than uh, uh, had been the case if... Um, the, uh, there have been two seasons, for example. Um, yeah, so then finally, uh, uh, Williams, uh, uh, very interesting and very specific anecdote actually about uh, forced cotton cultivation in, uh, in Busoga, because this, this one could, could probably call uh, forced cultivation, right? So uh, people had to grow two gardens, if I understand it correctly. The first one was being used for taxes, and the second one was being used to pay. Uh, the education of the, the elite, which would then serve in the interest of the colonizer and other people, right? So this is, I think, a very clear case of um, um, of, of, of force and, and also uh, uh, force that's, that's in, not in any way in the interest of, um, uh, of local people. Um, but I would like to make two sort of uh, comments in, in light of my broader argument here. The first one is that, uh, uh, to my understanding, uh, and I'm very happy to be corrected, but this was a practice that, that occurred maybe in the 1910s, maybe still in the 1920s, but at some point this was phased out. I mean, the taxes were still there, but these types of arrangements, to my understanding, were no longer uh, in place. They, they were scaled down and, and cotton continued to be grown on a very large uh, scale. Uh, eh, for uh, for a couple more decades uh, into the uh, the early 1970s, um, and the other point is that uh, I have actually in another paper of mine looked at the tax rates in Uganda, and I did not well I, I I'm not sure if I looked at Busoga specifically. I picked out a couple of different districts. I looked at the tax rates, and I looked actually at how much cotton were people growing, and what was the value of that cotton. And then you can see that actually they're growing a lot more than uh, what they have to pay in terms of taxes, right? And if their decision to grow the crop was only driven by taxes, then you would expect the people to pay just enough to pay their taxes and that's it. And then they would stop doing it. They would uh, put their energy into different activities, economic activities, cultural activities, doesn't matter. But that's not what we see. We see that people grow a lot more than you would expect if taxation was the only incentive. So uh, taxes play a role, coercion plays a, a role, but it's not the whole story. And it's also uh, much less intense yeah, than, uh, than in a place like Chad, which I, I think one could practically call an open air prison. Yeah? There people were really, really forced uh, and, and beaten if they, uh, well, there was some, some of this in Uganda as well, but very structurally, uh, this was part of the, the, the cotton growing uh, system there. And then finally, yes, I, I, I heard of this uh, anecdote in, uh, about, about uh, uh, Angola, what happened there with, with roasting of the seeds. And it's interesting to wonder why people did this, right? Because this was an area which was at the time also very dependent on labor migration. Uh, and apparently people preferred labor migration over uh, cotton cultivation. And I've never really looked into this, but I, I would imagine, I could imagine that uh, the ecology of this, of this part of Uganda is actually not very suitable. So you can grow the crop, but the yields will be so low that it's simply not worth your, uh, your effort. And that's why people resisted uh, because they needed to signal this to the colonial state and say, look, this is not working for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so right now I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, who I've been sitting in his chair. So I'll ask, Dr. Edgar to come actually sit here and I will yield the chair to him. But before I do that, I wish to thank you um, for committing time to uh, give this talk, but also allowing us to read your work, hear you talk about your work and the, of course to thank um, 
our discussant and physical and virtual audience. I'm not trying to take over Dr. Edgar's work. Edgar, please. No, I would, I would say that uh, I, I've been sitting in your chair for the last year or so. It's actually your chair and I'm, I'm just a temporary uh, <laughs> occupant. But thank you. Uh, um, uh, I'll just repeat what uh, uh, my colleague has said. Uh, thank you, uh, Mikhail, for the presentation and the material. Thank you to Dr. Ruda Bajuka uh, for the uh, discussion and everyone in the online audience. I think this, uh, uh, even though I've come in quite late, the discussion has been uh, quite interesting uh, for me, I think helpful for many of us who are doing different kinds of history, uh, social history, cultural history, to think with economic history um, in, uh, in new ways, I think is quite helpful for all of us. So uh, thank you. And uh, I hope that next time we will see you uh, here in the department. Uh, physically but thank you very much yeah i hope so too and i, I look forward to engaging with with all of you so also feel free to uh, send me an email uh, reach out i'm i'm looking forward to uh, to further engagement and, and further conversation so thank you all for your comments and participation